Um, thank you all for coming. To those of you who I told to show up, thank you for showing up. Um, for those of you I didn't tell to show up, I don't know why you're here, but thank you. Um, thanks to Africana for inviting me. Um, this project is a collaboration, as, it, as the slide shows, with Dr. Glenn Bracey in our department as well. He unfortunately is traveling for research, so he can't be here. Um, I will add the caveat, all the good, intelligent thoughts in this presentation will be from him, and all of the weird tangents are all me. Um, and a couple of the bad thoughts, we'll see if I blame him for that or not. This is very much a work in progress, so I look forward to your questions and comments throughout as we're working uh, through the idea that integration, in fact, is impossible. Uh, it being Black History Month, it is almost a law that you have to quote Martin Luther King as part of any presentation, and so I shall begin with that. The arc of the moral universe bends towards justice. We've all heard this quote at some point, and it's quite a lovely quote, and it turns out to not originally have been his. Originally, it is a paraphrase of a abolitionist sermon from the 1850s. And in both the sense that he uh, said it and the sense from the abolitionist sermon, this was, uh, has been misrepresented ever since. It emphasized the need to be active agents of justice, not to be passive recipients of that justice. Not to assume that justice is coming, but to be part of the bending of that moral arc. And there's an interdisciplinary com combination of scholars from Africana studies and sociology and other fields um, building around this same point that we need to be thinking about this bend as something we actively produce. And that the idea that we can sit back and watch progress occur in society is a fundamental flaw of Enlightenment thought more broadly. Students in my class got, um, got hit with one of the more intense theory pieces about that recently that uh, Enlightenment thought makes the mistake of thinking that there is a linear progression of society. Even what we see as very negative Enlightenment thought, like Marxist arguments about society, say that we go from one form of obfuscation about, about the reality of material domination to a less obfuscatory version of it, to finally capitalism, which is part of this linear progression towards the utopia according to Marxist arguments. Every Enlightenment argument had this belief in linear progression. And thus, ideas that come out of that Enlightenment thought, including how we think about integration and racial justice more broadly, and racial progress, um, is based along that assumption of linear progress. But as the quote, as properly thought about, maintains, that's an incorrect assumption. That only happens if people in society collectively act to create that justice. And so as I turn to integration, and does the, more, the arc of the moral universe bend towards integration, traditional measures of integration say yes, right? Selective higher education is more integrated than it was before, right? Magan will be pleased to know that he does indeed exist, and by traditional members, you are a sign of integration. Um, even technically sophisticated statistics, like entropy measurement, say the same, that we as a society are growing more demographically integrated. But the argument that we're going to make here is that there is a mistake in that assumption that demographic diversity is linked to integration, born out of a white frame, that enlightenment logic, for understanding the social world. So about Seven or eight years ago, after the 2010 census came out, a couple of pieces really sparked discussion amongst scholars of segregation and integration. Primarily, Ed Glazer and Jacob Vigder wrote a piece for the Manhattan Institute titled The End of the Segregated Century, which pointed out that there were no all-white neighborhoods left in society, pretty much, defined by the census tract. Uh, and that segregation, as generally understood, had continued to decline from its heights in the 70s. On the other hand, Pat Sharkey, stuck in place, argued that if you were black and poor two generations ago, your family is probably still black and poor and living in a predominantly black and poor neighborhood. 
The important point here is that the concept of segregation and integration is generally taken uncritically from quantitative studies of residential segregation. So even as we point out that uh, black poverty remains stuck in place, as Sharkey pointed out, we also say dissimilarity is down. Racial isolation is down. Racial exposure is up. There are no more all-white neighborhoods. And the critique of that claim, there are no more all-white neighborhoods, has generally been that that's true not because white and black have integrated so much, but because Asian and Latino in migration into previously all-white neighborhoods. That response continues to put the white experience as the primary experience to study. What is going on to the white neighborhood? The response has not been, we should be looking at the black experience first. And we argue that that is because integration has always been uncritically thought of as a form of assimilating into whiteness or assimilating into a white space. Part of that experience of assimilating into a white space, we argue, is the experience of no longer being a part, but not really being a part of. As Eduardo Bonilla Silva argues in his idea of honorary whites, and others have expanded upon in different ways to think about racialized groups, this idea of being able to assimilate into whiteness and be a part of it um, is only available to some racialized groups. More recently, Neda Magbula's study of Persian uh, communities in the United States argued that the Persian experience of race uh, identifies groups that act as what she calls a racial hinge. They can be whiter when that's valuable either to themselves and accepted by whites or um, or when that is valuable to whites to claim a more diverse identity for, for that group as a whole, or treated as non-white when that is the more valuable to the racial society or themselves. That ability to be a racial hinge has never been available to black people, with one caveat that occasionally Barack Obama, uh, his white mom got referenced quite frequently by white people who wanted to claim him back in 2008. And this is all because our concepts of integration and identity are founded in white supremacy. Integration is assimilation into those institutions that were purely white until we started to allow other groups in. Now, having said white supremacist, for a lot of people, that is a truly ugly term. Um, what we mean by white supremacist is the unspoken background of integration as an ideal the ideology that we should want to be in the same spaces as white people. Because whiteness is seen as superior, advanced, or pure. Their communities, their institutions, their spaces, their organizations. When we say such things explicitly, like Steve King does, it is uh, condemned. But the assumption behind that is much broader than explicit white supremacy. At the heart of the sociological concept of integration is something that's never actually been theorized, which allows this white supremacist ideology to creep in and dominate the discussion and go unquestioned. What actually is integration? What is just a baseline definition of to be integrated? Is there a number that you could give that says, well, now it is integrated? Is that number consistent across spaces? And if so, why? If you look at studies of segregation or integration, they never actually define it except as a measure of progress. Is it more integrated than it was? But never actually, this defines integrated as accomplished. And that is because it hasn't been really defined. And if it were to be defined, it would dis disrupt and dismantle this concept. And this idea of uh, white supremacy as an underlying background of things that seem ideal or good is a core concept of critical race theory. At the center of society's structures is and are racisms that operate without having to explicitly name themselves as such. The first step then in dismantling that is seeing supremacy where it operates 
even when it does not name itself as such. But let me back up, because that's a lot of um, theoretical arguments. Let's talk about the experience of integration, specifically my experience and Dr. Bracey's experience. Because one of the things that critical race scholarship has done for the social sciences is to argue that we should do, uh, we should recognize more different ways of creating knowledge than the traditional social scientific methodologies that were born out of that enlightenment flaw. So I'll give argument from anecdote uh, or autoethnography. I grew up in Princeton, New Jersey. There is no photo for this because I am the one giving the talk today. And I went to Princeton High School, which proudly proclaimed that its students came from 40 con different countries of origin, and they spoke 27 different languages at home. My parents were extremely proud that the first friend I made when we moved to Princeton was black. He moved two years later. Um, and my best friend is Latino, though he never self-identified as such until only the past couple of years, thanks to the current political situation. And overall, my experience was one that was technically racially integrated in high school. And yet, as I think about every single class I took as a junior and senior in high school, when classes were, were tracked, they were entirely white and Asian, except for one, uh, uh, one second generation Cuban and one African American. That's technically integrated. But my experience was not exposure to people uh, in meaningful ways in my classroom learning with me. Now, if anyone wants to have an amazing photo of Dr. Bracey, I have not warned you of this because I will only show it for a second or so. But Glenn's experience is a little bit different. Dr. Bracey was a fan of, being, of Little League. And in most photos of him between ages 9 and 12, he's wearing a Confederate flag. Because his Little League was the Dixie Youth Baseball League. Founded in protests to black attempts to integrate Little League, Dixie Youth Baseball quickly spread to all 11 former Confederate states and required all players to wear the league's flag-based insignia on their uniforms from 1955 to 1994. We were debating between the photo with him with the insignia right proudly on his chest, um, but that smile, I couldn't not. Um, Michael Jordan and Bo Jackson as well played for Dixie Youth Baseball. He grew up as a black man in the United States under the Confederate flag playing for a league founded explicitly for the goal of racial segregation. Years later, he asked his father why his parents sent him to play in a segregationist league. His reply, quote, we couldn't send you to Hugh McRae Park where the Babe Ruth teams played. That was where the Klan met. Hugh McRae actually donated that park explicitly for white use as well. So your choices for Little League were the integrated Confederate flag wavers or the league that played where the Klan met. Is that more integrated? Technically, yes, there were black kids playing in the league. It is the integrated league. But to ask them to wear a Confederate flag on their shoulder makes the idea that that's integrated seem absurd. More broadly, what we know is that integration, when we seem to see it, fails. Integrated neighborhoods are not stable. We often talk about gentrification as a uniquely extractive or invasive experience for black neighborhoods. But by and large, when we see any form of integration, gentrification, or racial flight, or whatever the case may be, what we're watching is, uh, when we see an integrated neighborhood, excuse me, is a neighborhood going through racial turnover. 10 years from then, it will be predominantly white or predominantly black. It does not stay integrated. West Mount Airy is one of the few examples where that's not the case. The reason for that was because integration was not just a goal to be thought about as ideal, but something that neighbors had to come together and actively participate in creating and supporting. 
They went door to door to stop real estate agents from blockbusting. At the time, uh, at the time that was happening, they demanded that uh, banks provide decent mortgages. And 50 years later, West Mount Airy still is proud of that legacy. But if you look at the maps of West Mount Airy internally, it has resegregated itself because it no longer is actively creating integration. Instead, it is resting on that identity. But we speak about gentrification as a unique form of extraction, when in fact, cities have been founded on, organized around politics based upon the extraction of wealth from black labor, either because the city was a port of trade during slavery or as exploitative of black labor as a cheaper form of labor compared to white labors, like Du Bois points out in his classic The Philadelphia Negro about the organization of Philadelphia at the turn of the 20th century. Then we have to grapple with the moment where we said, as a country, we want integration. The Fair Housing Act was explicitly saying we are sick of segregation and demand integration. But what Fair Housing Act focused on was enabling individuals to move from black neighborhoods into white neighborhoods, to never focus on dismantling the inequalities that made creating all white spaces beneficial to the people in those spaces. And thus, one law could never actually dismantle integration or dismantle segregation. Segregation actually got worse after the FHA was passed and has only recently fallen on average to levels before the FHA was passed. One of the key things the FHA did was because it focused only on residential racial segregation, it separated that form of integration from class and culture integration. Simply living near somebody was all that the government felt was its job to provide opportunity to accomplish. So is this what the civil rights was for? to allow some black middle class people to move into white neighborhoods, thus leading those white neighborhoods to see white flight and become predominantly black decades later. It was never actually about gaining access to white places or white spaces, it was about equ equality. Access for some is, as Du Bois put it in Black Reconstruction when discussing the Underground Railroad and slavery, the safety valve of that, uh, that era's racism. Allowing some people to escape slavery was part of how slavery was able to persist. The fugitive slave law could only be created if you had some fugitive slaves. Similarly, by creating a concept of integration that said we will only allow some people, those with means, to leave, and we will not ensure that we will fix the inequality behind that desire, is a safety valve. And in fact, we saw concentrated poverty and racialized concentrated poverty only rise after the FHA. That is, integration via a purely demographic definition of it allows racism to persist and to point to that as a reason to do so. We see school districts split to resegregate. Urban renewal efforts claim that they will do better to move poor people into mixed neighborhood incomes, but don't because they always treat one component of, a, of, a, of integration, race, class, and culture, as separate from the others, thus allowing desires for segregation to emerge through one of the other bases of that desire. So what we see today in society more broadly is that those integrative spaces, like we said about neighborhoods, are always fragile. And Rittenhouse Square, summarizes it, the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good, Rittenhouse Square was even as early as the 1950s when Jane Jacobs was writing The Death and Life of Great American Cities, a integrated space in who used it during the day. It's an exemplar of public space for all in the city. Who lives near it? Only white people effectively. How are people treated in it? The infamous Starbucks that created the Starbucks while black hashtag is one block away from Rittenhouse Square. If the cosmopolitan canopy 
as Eli Anderson described, these public spaces in which anonymous individuals can have interracial contact with low levels of hostility is all of one block in diameter. Is that really any meaningful concept of integration? If the cosmopolitan canopy involves white people talking to anonymous black people they did not know before about their friends who are white supremacists, is that really integration if the interaction is to ask a black person to interact with them being only one step removed from an avowed white supremacist? What good is that as a concept? We also know that integrated gentrifying neighborhoods, and this is uh, work by Laguey and Schaefer um, about New York City, are the spaces where police are most frequently called to police low-level um, uh, uh, noise complaints and other such things. This is getting to the second point about barbecue Becky's permit patties and the ease with which seeming demographic in integration splinters when threatened by blackness. But when we think about those spaces, we think about that as a problem of gentrification, not a problem of integration, because we define integration in our brains teleologically. Integration is good, and thus anything that is not good is not a sign of integration, but is a sign of something else and gets defined as something else. The problem of barbecue Becky's and permit patties is a problem of gentrification, not integration. But we do not have examples of integration that are not gentrification in, in one form or another, or do not have this case where blackness leads to the splintering of integration uh, frequently. This makes integration non-existent or demands black acquiescence to white norms to avoid racial friction. And that is where we get to this performative expectations of being an integrator. In order to be an integrator and not be threatening of that integration, one has to be seen as the pinnacle of success in a white organization or institution, and to be willing to be used as such while simultaneously isolated and vulnerable. And being used as such means that you will be upholding the symbols logics and institutions of a white system. The best example of that is colleges. And while I'm going to not use Villanova specifics, I will still go back to examples from our own experiences. Uh, broadly, schools that average a population that are 7% black, their brochures are 15% black in admissions. So you are twice as likely to be used as the face of your school because they want to appear integrated. Yet nothing comes to you from being asked to do that. I remember when they were taking photos when I was an undergraduate and asked my friend AJ three times in the day to join a photo of a class that he was not a part of, and yet I could not get onto that brochure, and not just because he was better looking than me. At Glenn's alum, uh, alma mater, the University of Florida of Gator Chomp and referring to other teams as Gator Bake is an echo of a racist myth that alligators preferred black flesh in the South. And you can go and look up uh, the cartoons of this um, back in the day. Right? So that was, again, to be a member of University of Florida is to reject that aspect of one's history or pretend to be comfortable with it or to be ignorant of it. On the other hand, because I won't only criticized Glenn's alma maters. As an Eve, a Williams College alum, Amherst was our hated rival. And Amherst in 2016 finally replaced the Lord Jeffs because they realized, only roughly 200 years after being founded, that naming oneself after an armor, army officer who advocated the use of smallpox as biological warfare was not the best way to appeal to non-white students. And so as a Williams College student, my first reaction was to be kind of proud that at least we were named after a purple cow and not a genocidal biological warfare. On the other hand, Williams students just used it as a joke to make fun of Amherst instead of critically examining the whiteness behind the idea that that person could conceivably be a decent mascot.
what we always see is the white space as the norm that black spaces are interpreted as in opposition to. Right? We see uh, people criticize parts of, uh, of Philadelphia, for example, as dirty, as disorganized, the kind of social disorganization theories of, of neighborhoods and spaces criticize disorganized black spaces routinely. Not the surveilled and disciplined in the Foucaultian sense of discipline white spaces as the problem that are not welcoming to people who do not fit the white way of being a civilian. It is the concentration of poverty that is seen as the urban crisis. Right? The origins of the, even from liberal academics who I admire greatly, the origins of the urban crisis were about origins of black uh, of concentrated poverty, racialized concentrated poverty, not the hoarding of wealth and the growth machine's control of city politics. Always because the white space is seen as the norm to be compared to. And what this all really comes out of is what Charles Mill famously called the racial contract. And so whenever I can acknowledge Charles Mills, I will do so. And Mills wrote, the norming of space is partially done in terms of the racing of space. The depiction of space is dominated by individuals, whether persons or subpersons, of a certain race. At the same time, the norming of the individual is partially achieved by spacing it, that is, representing it as imprinted with the characteristics of a certain kind of space. One of the things that's happened is people have started to incorporate Charles Mills' arguments into thinking through social science is that the fact that he led with racial segregation as the first way in which we created the racial contract um, has been lost. And one of the mistakes in social science in particular based on that oversight is that the history of racial residential segregation in the United States moves away from being seen as a novel form of social control that really emerged uh, after um, Jim Crow was abolished. Um, and rather, it becomes simply a continuation of the racial contract in a slightly different form. The racing of spaces just became a different type of space that got raced as opposed to a fundamentally new form of social control. That segregation from black is the primary mechanism of integrating into white historically, that that has been the basis of forming the concept of the white race. That the racing of space and people is, quote, mutually con constitutive, and thus a proper, def proper definition of integration must recognize that, that in dealing with the racing of space, we are dealing with the racing of peaceful and vice versa. But in sociology, we have been analyzing empirical reality using methods created under that white supremacist racial contract. And that's not just true of integration. Zuberi and Bonilla Silva go through a long list of methods and arguments about causality and how they are related to racial assumptions. In the case of integration, because we do not incorporate these ideas of power and this fundamental basis of segregating space as part of creating racial identities and racial inequality, that leads us to lack significant policy proposals. Most recommendations towards integration are simply to, in one form or another, hire more people of color or bring more people of color into a space. As though inclusion equals power. And this again goes back to the teleology of racial integration. Racial integration is both the means and the ends of efforts to address white domination. How do we resolve the problem of whiteness in a space? We bring non-white people into it. What is evidence that we have solved the problem of the whiteness of a space? Non-white people are in it. This allows room for whites to require potential integrators to shed or whitewash their identities as forms of history and culture as a condition of joining and staying in the organization. In other words, we argue, as a condition of integrating a white organization or space, one must cease being fully black. However, if integrating a space requires not being fully black, then a space can never actually be integrated. 
right? Because if people have to give up who they are, then they are not actually just joining the space, they are changing. So that the organization does not have to change. An organization continues to be racially exclusive and segregative if it does not include culturally black people. By shedding or force, being forced to shed one's culture or one's way of seeing the world or one's critiques, one does not integrate an organization because you have lost the new element that, would in, that you would introduce in order to actually be integrative. And what this kind of relies on, as a way of thinking about it, is that the way that we've thought about integration relies on the formal race definition of race. And Gatanda argues that there are four different concepts of uh, uh, de four different racial definitions. Formal, historical, status, and cultural. I just switched the order around in my brain for some reason, so they're not going to be in that order. Formal, which is the one that we've traditionally used for understanding integration, treats race as neutral, apolitical descriptions reflecting merely skin color or country of origin, and is unrelated to ability, disadvantage, or moral culpability. Critically, formal race categories are, quote, unconnected to social attributes such as culture, education, wealth, or language. And as such, only formal race definitions treat racism as unconnected to social inequalities. Only a formal race definition can allow claims like anti-white discrimination via a program like Black Girls Code, which is currently the most recent lawsuit that I read about, or the logic of John Roberts, who wrote that the way to stop discriminating on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. Historical race, on the other hand, recognizes that government has previously used categories to subjugate groups, and those have generally been used to uh, limit remedial policies around that historical subjugation, but even that historical race concept gets us closer to integration. Status race sees race as an indicator of social status. Black is seen as low status, white is high status. Many efforts to eradicate discrimination assume discrimination is based on status race. We discriminate because we see it as low status. Yet efforts to eradicate either have to acknowledge that explicitly and run the risk of uh, coming into disagreement with our legal definition of formal race uh, or have to obfuscate that reality. And finally, culture race uses categories that refer broadly to shared beliefs and social categories, raced communities and traditions of self-awareness amongst a group. If we only integrate using formal race, because of that history of unequal power and because of how whiteness operates, we will never actually have full integration. Integration needs to address historical, cultural, and status concepts of race as well. And so what we argue is that we need to define integration from beyond the veil, to use Du Bois, to ground our theory and measures of integration in the perspectives of people of color. And because of the unique status of black Americans and blackness through Afro-pessimist thought as kind of the, the opposite pole from whiteness, Though I'd also, we've been going back and forth um, about whether or not to start from settler colonialism and native experiences as a similar origin point. But for indigenous groups, integration is not even an option, which once again shows the problem of the concept is under-theorized. For indigenous groups, integration is erasure by legal definition because blood quantum defines who is and who is not Native American according to our legal system. So to be integrated and have the possibility of intermarriage is to ensure your erasure as a racial group because they are technically defined by their ancestry. So a critical race theory centered in blackness allows us to get to the actual point of integration as a social project that integration is only real if it addresses power dynamics in an organization or a space, if it addresses social change that is required for any power dynamics to shift, and that does not see adding 10 drops of black to make a more pure white paint, 
to use the Ralph Ellison comparison, that it is not skin, skin deep, that segregation and thus integration will always be a project about racial power. And that the civil rights movement, and for activists and critical scholars, it has always been a concept of equalizing racial power and minimizing domination, and never just about representation. That integration has always been about reordering, reimagining, and remixing power and in institutions as opposed to simply coloring them. That concept of integration is explicitly anti-white supremacist. But I wanted to get back to Ellison, I just realized. Ellison notes, being around non-whites who are not trained in interacting with white people in a way that, that reaffirms the white domination of a space is exciting and transgressive for whites while also being culturally and socially degrading. And we can see films about the white teacher going to the hood and teaching black kids as the prime examples. I want to say Dangerous Minds, but y'all are too young for Dangerous Minds. So Freedom Riders. And if you're still too young for Freedom Riders, I can go to more recent ones, but those two are just so pure in how they did that. That that reinforces the concept of whiteness. Whiteness survives contact with black spaces or the black other by consuming it into whiteness, by training it how to interact with white people in a way that allows them to question individual white people without necessarily questioning the white supremacy of that space or that organization, or by leaving those people behind very quickly. Right? Integration as a racial project is not inherently anti-racist, as Ibram Kendi pointed out. Assimilationist arguments have been racist from the jump and most continue to draw from that status race argument that we should assimilate because one culture is doing it better than the other. And within any organization, we can see a logic like this in social science. And the go-to example is the argument about education. Seeing that as because black culture is not strongly supportive of education persists to this day as an argument even though there has never been any good social science evidence of that. Students in my class remember that for a week or two from now. Um, never. And yet we continue to hear people make that claim. When the reality of the history is of white people not allowing black people to get the educations they have desired for generations and generations. So what does that actually mean for measurements? We don't have a good, here is your new statistic to use. But at all points, it's time to reunite the study of integration with the study of power. It is not enough to simply say, this is how many black people there are in a space compared to previously. But rather to, simply, to, to ask about, um, are black and other people of color in enough positional power to do some agenda setting? Are they embedded enough in the institutions, organizations, or neighborhoods, networks? And do we have multiple types of networks across multiple identities? So to go back to, to the, the example of higher education, are there enough peer professors of color? Are there enough professors of color in higher, uh, at higher ranks in administration? Are there relationships with working class black people and staff members as well in order to see the multiplicity of black identities in this space and do they have the power to be part of the agenda setting for an educational institution. If they don't, that institution is not fully integrated, even if it could point to its numbers as better than they were 10, 15, 20 years ago. That the demographics should always start not from a baseline change of no representation, but a baseline of equal representation. The assumption should be this space should look like the community around it. And if it does not, why not and how much, how far from it, not this should look not segregated. So uh, what does that mean? This is where I get to go on my quantitative nerd tangent because 
Dr. Bracey's not here to tell me no. Um, the best example of this is one that I, I wrote a piece actually with my dad about because he complained that social scientists had misinterpreted physics and I complained that social scientists were misinterpreting reality. And it turned out we were saying the same thing, just differently. Um, one of the difficulties for the study of racial residential segregation is incorporating more than two groups at a time. It was easy to measure black-white, or white Asian, or black Latino, whichever, as long as it was only two groups. But cities are no longer just two populations. They never really have been but now especially, we're far more multiracial. Economists took the idea of entropy and they screwed it up. So I get to make fun of economists a little bit. Um, uh, and came up with this idea of information. And so what that had is the baseline was complete segregation was a zero. And a world in which we were as diverse as possible, where if there were four groups in one neighborhood, 25% of that neighborhood was group one, 25% group two, 25% group three, 25% group four. That was the ideal, right? Segregated to integrated, it seems. But in no city are all four groups 25%. So the actual concept of integration would be one in which each city or each neighborhood looked like the city's population. That's entropy. But because the interest was how far away are we from segregated on a demographic level? We've been doing it wrong for generations. That's my quantitative nerd tangent. All right. So what this all ends up with is that an integrated space is experientially non-exploitative of racial identities. That every individual in a space has the opportunity and the ability to bring their full racialized self to that space without contradiction. And by contradiction, we're thinking about the idea of subtyping. So one contradiction, actually, that we're talking about is the difficulty of being black and working in a building named for a slave owner. An easy fix, and yet one that only recently has emerged as a fix that many organizations are finally taking. Or subtyping, where whites accept some people of color because they subcategorize them as not like that group, conceptually, denying their race as contrary to the safety as white. Being comfortable in the presence of the other is a non-thing. Gatanda argues that non-recognition is critical to the success of this demographic concept of integration. Blackness has no meaning without those stereotypes to whites. And thus, non-recognizing someone is not black allows us to continue to believe blackness is those stereotypes. And to not recognize that black person as an equal member of the organization and individual, and instead as what we're calling the unique unicorn of blackness. Because we got a little loopy when we were writing that section. Social psychs tell us that whites subtype regularly around people of color that they interact with. They see them not as white, because they are obviously different, but also not truly black, somehow exceptional in one way or another, whatever that may be. You become the racial ex exception that's unnamed. And Du Bois, again, I like to go back to Du Bois, Du Bois points this out in both Souls of Black Folk and the Philadelphia Negro. In Souls of Black Folk, he points out that he gets asked constantly about knowing a good doctor as a way to talk about, I have some black friends who aren't like the black problem that white people did. Um, in the Philadelphia Negro, he points out that racial prejudice, color prejudice, is most harmful, according to him, to people who do not fit that stereotype. So that the racial prejudice says black people are like this, and if you're not like that, you're not really black. So your choice is either to accept the stereotype and get recognized for the racial category that you're treated as, or to struggle in this liminal space where you are neither black nor white. Subtyping, if we go back to Mills, is recalibrating the norming of space and the norming of individuals when the space does not do the work Mills says space does. Right. That allows us to recalibrate that this space stays white even though we have let a non-white person into it 
because we're not really treating them as fully non-white, not letting them express that, that fully non-white identity. And so what we see in persistent reality, we see persistent demographic segregation, even by the measures that, we're telling, that I'm arguing are incomplete. Segregation persists, though most scholars acknowledge this, right? that even as we are getting more demographically integrated, there's still a long way to go. But even in spaces and places in which we see integration uh, emerging, the norms and structures of the institutions are not changing. And those norms and structures of institutions, as Wendy Leo Moore points out in Reproducing Racism, borrowing from Adler's classic about gendered organizations, that the norms and structures of an institution built in whiteness means that regardless of who wields that power, if they are not given the opportunity to radically change those norms and structures, they are then reinforcing the organizational whiteness. The microaggressions are being somewhat misinterpreted, not as trauma, though they can be traumatic, but rather as evidence of the exploitation of racial identity. They are illustrations of the persistence of segregation in white people's lives. And they've been consistently misinterpreted as causing problems rather than as evidence of that experience of segregation for white people. White people, excuse me, microaggressions tell us that white people still see the racial other as an other and in need of defining in comparison to the first notice. The purpose of microaggressions is to minimize and denuder and disempower the racial impurity in the org as a form of reasserting power in that organization. Microaggressions are resistance to what is perceived as a racialized corruption or contamination, which gets to that psychological element that Foucault points out, that to see power in an organization, do not look at an organizational chart, but look at where there are interpersonal resistances. The power play reveals that in the white mind, they are still in a segregated situation, that it is still a white space, and that this is the psychological tell of subtyping, even when our metrics say there is demographic inclusion and thus integration. If we switch to a definition that explicitly centers black experiences, what we see is black people who see the demographic segregation, feel isolation, know when a microaggression is either just rudeness or an enactment of racial power, and know that when it's an enactment of racial power, that power is backed and protected by white leadership and racist notions of white supremacy. And they know they do not have the power to stop those microaggressions that reveal the consistency of the whiteness and the willingness to use it. And they hear from their closest white allies things like, I don't even think of you as black. Even the friendliest and best of whites can still isolate black people. And living and thinking in a segregated space, that to accept a black person in that space is to whiten them. So from a white perspective, whites live in a segregated world. Their microaggressions show it. From a black perspective, they're living in a segregated world. They've been yelling that at us white people for a long time. Whites thus make it impossible to integrate through these demographics, through the performance of microaggressions, through the power dynamics, and through psychological means. And sadly, we don't have measures of that. But also, do we really need numerical measures of that? The desire for numerical measures of that goes back to that enlightenment thought that we can quantify everything and that we should be looking to quantify everything and that if it's not quantifiable, it's not true. This argues against that. So what we see is we think about what we've described as integration and we, alter and we change our understanding of it. Integration maintains othering. Integration maintains the idea that you are different from me and that is why you should be in this space with me. We must reject that at first principle. But what that means does not mean erasure of difference, because we cannot just simply erase that away. This is not some post-racial hocus pocus. But rather an erasure of the difference between the relationship between racial difference and outcomes. That a space can tell that I know if a space is white or black tells me if I know if that space is well funded or not, if that space is well regarded or not. 
if that space is well integrated into political networks is no, or not, is a sign of integration as impossible. What that means is that integration would be a non-event because it would follow from and is part of the destruction of white supremacy. It follows from the reality that segregation was central to creating whiteness institutionally and as a personal investment. That whiteness is a racial project and that as a racial project, its only concept was a claim of domination. All modern racial projects really originate in response to that original claim of whiteness as a legitimation of domination. Integration then includes the rejection of and disidentification with whiteness. Not a rejection of white as one's formal race category, but a rejection of all of the other racial, racial concepts as a status concept as a, as, and as a cultural concept. Which is why we say integration is impossible. Integration is impossible because to integrate means there is no whiteness in that space anymore. And if there is no whiteness, what are we integrating with? Integration then, as we propose it, would be oriented around organizations grounded in, founded by people of color's networks and perspectives to which whites could join on the condition of disidentifying with that white racial project of domination. At its core, Surrendering whiteness for the sake of equality leads to greater freedom. On the flip side, asking people to surrender their non-whiteness for the sake of inclusion into whiteness is to reaffirm domination as an act, to recreate it as an act. So we believe that integration is understood is an impossibility, and rather integration should be understood as something in which the first step is for whites to reject the physical the physical and psychological wages of whiteness in favor of an identity based in equality, not domination. And thus, the impossibility of integration is a hopeful place. Thank you. Do you have some sort of system here? Before I turn it over to the audience to uh, ask thousands of meaningful questions, I need to make a, a commercial announcement. Is that all right? Okay. Um, this, um, this Friday at uh, 6.30 in the Connolly Cinema is Wakanda Night. You guys know Wakanda, right? If you don't know Wakanda, you should come, all right? I mean, you know, we want to welcome all of you to Wakanda, all right? Um, dress as if you're Wakandans. Come on, you know somebody who can help you with that, all right? Yeah, dress as if you were Wakandans, and we're going to have food, fun, and film. Ijitu is going to help everybody figure out the Wakanda stuff, okay? Yeah. Um, and then on next Monday, Monday, uh, I believe it's Monday, Dr. Jasmine Cobb, who is a Villanova graduate, is going to be joining us to uh, talk to us about her new project that's going to be uh, February 25th at lunchtime. And lunch will be served. Yes, 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 yes. I believe in feeding people, all right? Lunch will be served. This is going to be in the alumni events room uh, that will be in Gary, room 31, all right? So come at 11.30, get your plate, come sit down, talk to people, meet Dr. Cobb, you know, network, have her tell you how great Carol Anthony was in her formation. She have nothing to say about me, but we'll go on and on, all right? So um, please come to Wakanda night. Bob, that means you too. Bob, come, yes, all right? And um, come to uh, Dr. Cobb's uh, talk. So without further ado, uh, you all have lots of questions for um, Dr. Kramer. Or not. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to ask you to repeat your final comments. I was okay. taking notes of something else that you had said, and I think the comment that you made summing up your talk was important, and I missed it. Okay, sure. So integration is 
the idea that integration is impossible is hopeful because it is the idea that it is um, that it starts with whites rejecting the psychological wages of whiteness and allowing themselves to be kind of to to follow instead of lead, to have an identity based in equality instead of an identity based in domination. I said it better when I wasn't reading the notes. <laughs> So do I think it will happen soon in large scale? I'm not an optimist. There are hundreds of years of building up benefit to sticking with whiteness. Um, so to see enough white people do that is going to be difficult. That said, the systems we have don't demand that everyone do it en masse. They demand that people in power do it. right? So imagine if you will, that I was so unbelievably moving that the provost and the president and all of the deans were here and moved entirely and changed their whiteness. While most of Villanova will not have changed their whiteness, if those white people do, that's particularly meaningful for an organization because integration is about that aspect of power and domination, and they're the ones with power and domination. So we have lots of examples of white people doing good work, right? This is not, I cannot be up here giving this presentation and not believe that. Or if I do, I'm unbelievably cynical. I'll leave it to you to decide which of those two it is. Um, what we need is more white people with power doing that work. In fact, one of the fascinating things about this, is it, as an aside, is one piece that we haven't really worked through is how intermarriage has been seen as the pinnacle of true social integration um, and how that doesn't really line up with meaningful social integration because most intermarriage of white and black is amongst the working class. Amongst power, intermarriage is not a thing that's happening uh, for whites. And so, so incorporating power into that shows that these, look, there's more intermarriage, is again, not really reflective of true integration. So by thinking about power, we both say we're doing worse, but also can point to a more tangible, this is what it would take, than just everyone could love everybody and everyone could live next to everybody type of hocus pocus version, which never really works. Yeah. So was this whole thing, yeah, so. But, okay, so obviously like you're here giving this talk, but like I feel like it's still people of color who are, were like resonating with this message and were like kind of like this. How is it not like the role of people of color to educate white people on what this means? Because like my friend Camille was saying like this is the first talk that has ended with like white people have to do something first instead of like people of color mm -hmm. but that still requires a certain education mm -hmm. that I feel like just a lot of people of color are the ones that know that and would have to take the role of educating white people so that still is like you know what I mean? Yeah so this is one of those problems where where to grow up non-white in a white society is to understand whiteness Right? To grow up white in a white society is to not understand whiteness. Right? So um, we create resources for white people to get it. And the first step of that creation was non-white people, has always had to start with non-white people. But that work has, part of what I'm arguing is that work's been done. Right? We can point to people who have written that work time and time again. And that's not to say don't write that work yourself if you want to write that work. Do that. Right? Because I'm not... Part of this is whatever non-white people want to do, they should be free to do. But much of it is, is, is when asked to educate and that's not what you want to do, to simply say, I'm not going to do that. You need to go do the work. And if they're not willing to, to respond to that and say, you're right, I need to do this work, then they're not ready to actually learn it. So if you say, go do that work, and then I'll have a conversation with you, because I like having conversations with people, cool, right?
But if they're not willing to do that background work for you, then they're asking you to do all the labor, and that's not integrated. So if you can put on them, here's what I ask of you in order to participate in this. And then they either have to do it or not. And so what I'm asking of you is only a question that you would pose to the white person to test them, which is a lot less, but it still does require something. Ashley? So the difficulty is that the, the black person in the white space can't take whiteness. Right? They can't gain a little bit of whiteness. Because whiteness is always about dominating the other. So what they can do is learn how to be the type of black that is OK in a white space. A white person can take blackness, but they're not really taking blackness because blackness was defined by white people as less than. But they're taking that little piece of culture in order to make their whiteness a little bit more tenable for themselves. So that type of admixture doesn't really promote integration. We should, no one, there's nothing to want from a whiteness that is based in domination. There's something to want from the power that white people have. There's something to want from the education white people might have on average more. But there's nothing from whiteness itself that you would want. And there should be nothing from whiteness that white people want. That doesn't mean that I'm saying I'm not white or I'll ever be anything but white. But to say that in terms of culture and status understandings of whiteness, I reject those understandings and need to replace them with one that is based in equality. What we ask of black people in that case is, is, is nothing, right? Because to ask them to do something to fix a system that has been subjugating them is to continue to demand their effort for my benefit. Mm -hmm. So where does that leave people that grew up in a white environment? Because like you're essentially talking about how if like I say were to go into like an organization, like I should be able to express myself freely, but what if I was conditioned to be able to gear towards white people? Like there's like a gray area there. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. I actually my my first published paper was about blacks black and Latino students at elite private high schools who saw their reason for being at these high schools as being the ones who taught white people how to be less racist. And so that was why they deserved their spot. Um, and it's, kinda, it's not exactly the same, but it kind of it, it reminds me of that. Um, to be black and have lived in only white spaces is to have been trained pretty fully how to be the acceptable black person. right? What this says is then, to white people, if you ever stray from that, how do they react to straying from that? As you explore your own identity, right? When you decide to do something different, do they tell you, whoa, you changed, that's weird? Or do they say, oh, cool, right? That's them saying, this is within the bounds of acceptable or not. When they, if they weren't creating those bounds and you didn't change anything at all as hypothetical black person who's only experienced living with white people, because I don't know you necessarily, um, uh, if you change or not, is your choice, not guided by their microaggressions. right? But if it's in all guided by white people's reactions too, because whites are empowered in that space, then whiteness is still performing domination. So I don't know what would change, if anything. Maybe nothing would change. But we haven't had that space to see. So it doesn't abolish ideas of race, because um, things are real if they're real in their consequences. And we've made race real, right? As much as I, can, I, as much as I start you know, every semester with race is a social construction, it has no basis in biology, it has no meaning except that which we give it, we have given it meaning. Um, 
abolishing whiteness is abolishing the claim to domination, not the racial identity. Right? It is saying, as a white person, how do I act in spaces that either recreates the assumptions about races that we have created for 400 or so years, or not do that? Right? That would be this, this whiteness built, in, built out of equality. That's the white person who, um, uh, I don't like the term ally because it makes it seem like it's their fight and I just decided to join in because I'm so good, um, right? which recreates this kind of whose struggle is it. Um, so the white person who doesn't have to be guilted into that but sees it as a basic premise of being a human to fight for racial justice is rejecting their whiteness consciously. But then there's a lot of work to actually putting that into place because there are so many structures pushing you towards you know, being a good white person but dominating the conversation and whatnot. So it's about thinking through all of the ways that domination works. But that doesn't mean rejecting race. It just means rejecting the domination behind it. Ooh, damn. Um, what is blackness is the pro, uh, so that is a question and a half um, that I think is not one that I am 100% comfortable with any answer I've heard before or that answer that I'm coming up with myself. But I'd say blackness is the performance of resistance to that. Resistance is not necessarily you know, what we think of in terms of uh, activism. But whatever comes emerges to, to express one's humanity in a system in which one's humanity is doubted and questioned is a form of resistance. Um, and so that is where we see all of the uniquely black cultural forms that have emerged have been about rejecting that premise that they are dominated. So blackness is that it is at its core that resistance. I think. <laughs> I like that question. Well, I arrived late, so you may have touched on this already. Probably not. <laughs> um, where do uh, programs of affirmative action, particularly in higher education? fit into this understanding, and you can think about that as in how they actually function or how they like, ideally function. Yeah, so uh, the best example of this is that diversity, as it's described, is a performative process, right? It, it's really something that is to perform integration without actually meaningfully integrate, right? Uh, Natasha Wariku's book is kind of, uh, The Diversity Bargain is, is one of the exemplars of that argument of it. To me, I think the most telling aspect of affirmative action is when we think about the justification for it. In a room, we generally think about concepts of racial justice and discrimination and inequality, right? That, that we have treated this, we have subjugated this group, and we should take that into account as part of our understanding of merit. Legally, that's not the reason for, for we are not allowed to make that claim legally. Legally, it is because diversity is better for everybody. Right, so affirmative action, as it's performed, as it's done, is a system that allows the black integrator as the individual, but not integration as a systematic process. Right, affirmative action says, we're going to let you individual non-white people into this space, but we're not going to change anything else about the space. We don't have to do a single thing other than hire you or accept you. But that's the reason why there continue to be so many racial tensions is because nothing else really changed until non-white people had to take the first step of demanding this isn't enough. And so affirmative action as followed is a band-aid on an arterial wound. And I'm not going to rip a band-aid off, but I'd really rather fix the arterial wound. Dr. Kata. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>